Yeah. Hello. Um, I won't say good morning or good afternoon because I don't know what time of day it is, seeing as I don't know what time you're watching this recording. <laughs> anyway, I'm Sebastian. A um, little bit about me. I am autistic. I have epilepsy and I do like memes a lot. Here I'm in a meme, um, which hopefully Stephen will be able to put on, um, inspired by this presentation. The lovely Stephen invited me to be here today and it was short notice and I was busy and couldn't make it. So I replied to his email and thought that was that. Anyway, he very promptly replied telling me we could pre-record this, meaning I'd have to prepare with even less time. Steve, what a great guy, thinks outside the box, finding solutions for all the problems we didn't need solving. <laughs> anyway, to be honest, I was actually very flattered to be asked and it's a real pleasure to be able to do this. It's worked out perfectly as it happens because I'm going to be talking to you today about the importance of being part of a community. And so I'm very pleased to tell you all that the reason I'm not here in person today is because I'm out in yonder community, frolicking free, ticking all those engagement boxes, planning a journey, using public transport, exploring a new place, practicing with my money, maintaining a relationship. I totally get why upper management folk get so excited about this stuff. I'm a big lover of lists myself, really fun pastime, ticking the boxes. Anyway, what is community? If we break the word down, there's common and unity. Common, having something in common with others, a common interest, football, for example, a common experience, bereavement, for instance, then there's unity and being united, standing together. So a community, I guess, is people with a link of one kind or another, sharing that wonderful feeling of being part of something bigger than ourselves. So we try to think of some different types of community. It can be important to support people to be part of. I'll begin by saying, as I mentioned it already, there are communities that are based around enjoyment of the same interests and hobbies. So interests and hobbies is one. I would like to now ask you all to shout out some ideas, but I can't see or hear you. So I sort of have to imagine the usual type of video call attendees and I hope I get it somewhere near right. So going yes, you, the chap wearing smart shirt, but beneath the camera wearing embarrassing Christmas loungewear. Our home community. Yeah, good answer. No special relationships we have and we share in our home, our housemates, our family, even our pets. Um, anybody else? Lady with the fake background, because you're ashamed of the state of your office. Local area, yeah. Our village, the town, the city that we live in. Person there who doesn't understand how to unmute themselves, valiantly trying to communicate their answer through the medium of interpretive dance, I see. Is that work community? Yes, our feeling of belonging with our colleagues. I'm sure you can all identify with that one. One more, the person discreetly leaning off camera every now and then because they're secretly snapping during this. Experiences, culture, background. Great answer, thank you. Go back to your pot noodle. So I think that went really well. Great input. Coincidentally, you actually all came up with the exact same answers and ideas that I was thinking of. I'm just thinking as well, we're meeting here online and that's another brilliant way to find a sense of community. It's a way to be part of even a global community. Um, I want to say that accessing the community is not the same thing as being part of a community. I think when I was arranging my slides and then I realised that that was far too confusing because I go off on different tangents, that was going to be on the slide. Anyway, I think before going into the benefits of community inclusion, it's really important to say that truly being included feeling a sense of belonging, 
being part of a community is a separate issue from accessing the community. Community access is something that's already hammered into everyone, the importance of it, and that's really good. People definitely should all have the right to leave their house. I'd certainly like to believe anyway in your organisation, you're giving people those opportunities without anyone needing to convince you about why you should. What I think there could be a danger of is there could be some complacency. If an individual, when you look at their daily diary with them and you can see that they leave the house every day of the week, that important aspects of their well-being could be overlooked. We'll go like, wow, they go out every day, they buy a drink at the shop, go swimming, do walks, cinema, fantastic. And that person may feel content if they don't yet know that there could be something more, progression, potential to meaningful experiences to unlock. This hypothetical individual I will talk about, they have community access in abundance, but what we maybe don't then look at is that all of those things they do, they do it just with a member of staff. They've been living in the area a long time, but they don't know any of their neighbours. They don't talk to people in the shop. They wait outside while the staff buy their drink for them. They aren't meeting a friend at the cinema. Maybe they prefer going alone, but has anyone asked or have they just not been given any opportunities to make friends who want to go to that film with them? They love standing in the swimming pool, doing exercises. They like copying their sports staff's actions, following an exercise routine. At home, they love music. There isn't music at the public swim session, but there's actually an aqua aerobics class at that very same swimming pool, only an hour later than when they go anyway. Dance, water, and music. Why haven't they been given a chance to go along and see if they want to join? Perhaps the member of staff says, but they've never mentioned wanting to join a club. But maybe I need to think, does the person know that clubs exist? Do they know that's something they can ask for? Is the person likely to spontaneously ask for something? Or should I have that staff been presenting these options in a way they understand best, you know, and talking to them so that they can make an informed choice of whether they want to join a club or not? Being part of a community means being embraced for who you are. It's not a case of being tolerated or ignored. We're not upset, offended, angered by your existence or presence in our space because actually we don't notice you at all. That's the danger of community access. Being part of a community is walking down the street to the shop and people saying hello to you. You're at the counter getting your drink and the shopkeeper says, seen the new Spider-Man film yet? I know you love spy um, superhero films. What I find great about being part of my local community is it makes me happy that lots of people shout out hello to me when I'm walking down the street. The people in the shops know me, so my support worker could take a step back because if I'm confused about my money, the shopkeeper will talk to me directly. They'll show me what I need, need to be doing. They don't look past me to someone else. It helps with work, a reputation for having a good work ethic spread around the town. So it was a lot easier for me to get a chance in other places so as to fill my week productively. Having community links was really helpful when we did fundraising and engaging a community about autism acceptance. I was easily able to arrange an interview to publicize our event on local radio. There's the safety aspect. Part of my condition, I can wander off. I can be confused and not be aware of what I'm doing. If that happens, then it's been totally different if I've been in my own community versus a community where I'm not known. Even if you're in your local area, if you're not known to people, then they aren't going to know if you're safe on your own or not, even if you aren't dressed appropriately or are hurt or behaving oddly and they notice that. People can be less inclined to get involved. They might be scared, 
think it's better to keep their distance when they hope someone else will do something. When you're truly an integrated part of your community, people look out for you. Everyone looks out for each other. Around here, if I'm sat on a bench waiting because mum went in to buy a coffee, someone will have approached me while she's in there pretty much all of the times because they'll be straight over to ask, you know, if I'm by myself and check that I'm where I'm supposed to be and that I'm okay. My uncle, um, his name's Tony, he lives close by to us and he also has autism and a learning disability. He's able to get out and about himself entirely independently. Um, and he's thrived here being part of the town's community. He completely prefers to do things alone. He doesn't like to stop and interact with any one person for too long. He'd hate to be in an activity with other people, but that choice, as, as he puts it, do his own thing until we meet again, doesn't mean he values his community any less. He's known in every cafe and every shop. They know his name, they know what he buys. He has his interactions in the way that work for him and everyone respects that. He'll buy a cup of tea and then suddenly shout across the cafe um, to share a story about a time that a black Labrador barks at him or volunteer his extensive knowledge about military history or steam trains and then finish the interaction. But he will tell you proudly that all of those people are his friends and they will say how much they love him and look forward to seeing him. One man who's a fellow train enthusiast started saving all his old magazines and DVDs for my uncle. My mum and uncle used to always argue about the fact that when he buys himself books, DVDs or CDs, when he's finished with them, he wouldn't take them to a charity shop or give them to anyone else, even though he'd spent a lot of money on them and not had them for long. And my mum, she really hates waste. <laughs> and, you know, being sister and brother, they, they have their little arguments. His attitude was he didn't want them, but he didn't want someone else to have them. And he would purposefully completely destroy them so that mum couldn't rescue them from the bin and pass them on to someone else. But it was actually for all those years of mum trying to have those conversations, it was making that friendship with the man in the community was the first time that my uncle was able to process that for himself that mum had been saying. And he actually stops destroying his things. He said, I can give them to Derek, like he gives me his magazines. And they can share, share those things and their interests with each other. Now, if he has too many and Derek doesn't want them, it no longer upsets him to give them to the charity shop because he reasons that other people like Derek will enjoy them. And it's actually a nice thing to make other people happy because he's experienced that give and take. That's something I think is really important. The idea that everything isn't only about people being nice to us, people reaching out, people giving us things or making accommodations for us. We'll get the mutual benefits of a strong community if we all contribute in a way that we can. If you're doing baking in the house, then it'll be nice to head round to the neighbors and bring them cake, reach out, say hello ourselves. If they find it difficult, to move their heavy bin on bin day, offer to move it for them each week. There are plenty of strengths that people with support needs have. Everyone can help out in our own way. The true friendships are based on both sides, making an effort and doing things that they can to bring joy to each other. If the local community always donates Easter eggs or Christmas decorations to your care home, it's you know, remembering to encourage everyone to make thank you cards themselves for everyone out there as an individual don't just send an official thank you from the office i guess that's kind of a scale now of how we're viewed in the community sometimes when a care home or supported living is opened the neighbors get upset they imagine there's going to be trouble they really don't want our type on their street yeah i don't have any problem with disabled people I do have a friend who's vision impaired, but there's a limit, isn't there? Don't need to be, you know, they need to be somewhere appropriate. So, yeah, obviously that's the bottom of the scale. They really don't like us. 
they don't have to be shouting abuse directly at us. It's just very clear what their views are. But well, I think we can get stuck and confused and all move on from is higher up that scale where actually everyone loves us. Oh, see that house there? They've all got special needs. They're really well behaved, don't cause trouble to anyone. So nice to see them living their best life in the community, isn't it? They get in that minibus every day, always off somewhere or other. So nice. So this person decides to have her neighbours around for a little party, but she doesn't invite us. And it's not because she doesn't like us. It's because she still sees us, in, you know, in a certain level as something separate to her. We're going out on our little minibus doing what we do. And in fairness to her, oh, she did try to chat with me once and realised we enjoy the same books. But quite quickly, my support worker stepped in and apologised if I was bothering the lady and said, oh, he's far too friendly, this one, and whisked me away. She also wonders how she'd be perceived if she were to phone me to invite me to a book group that she goes to. Would that make her seem creepy or predatory in some way? So a lot of the openness does need to come from our side as well, because sometimes other people are genuinely just not sure what's okay and what's not. That's so not only people with support needs who don't know what's okay and what's not, everybody has that same level of learning and you know responsibility to reach out. Then and only then can we hit the top of the scale where we are totally equal in our community. That also means we practice, we learn, we take accountability for our behavior. We reflect if we've done something that makes someone not want to invite us again. It might be a learning curve, because actually when people are just being nice to us and are viewing us as a charity case, they make one heck of a lot more allowances and it is one way and we get everything. Like we get to eat all the cake from the buffet, interrupts people, if things go our way, because those outside people, they don't know if we can help it or not and they don't want to upset us on the staff. But when it becomes a real friendship, we do need to all do all of that training and practicing those skills again and again about us making allowances for other people too. Because in a friendship outside of a care company's safe confines, if you act like a jerk and nick all of the cake, like you're at risk of someone actually telling you you've been a jerk and nicked all of the cake and it might not be said quite as nicely you know, as someone at your supported living might communicate it to you. And that could be really challenging and a big shock if it's new. But the benefits are huge because the world opens up to us exponentially. We're learning empathy and we build relationships. And it's so nice to know that all these people genuinely want to hang out with us when often as much as the staff obviously do genuinely like us they are being paid to be there and it's so nice when you're opening up those relationships where it's purely by choice a good way to find shared interest groups to join in the wider community is to do your research go to the library or tourist information look online you can ask the social prescribers at your GP surgery. They usually have a, a lot of information. Um, even they will sometimes accompany you to, to a group to start with. So if a support worker is able to step back, maybe if somebody's ready for that step, settle on their own. So it's really good talking to them about, about different things that are possible. Look for posters on notice boards and shops, stuck to lampposts. Um, every day could be a treasure hunt looking for those activities. Yeah, things just pop up everywhere. Colouring groups can be great because they're really accessible already to a wide range of needs. Adult colouring is so popular now and there isn't that stigma to being a grown up and enjoying colouring in. Walking groups are good because you get fit and you can chat along the way. Chatting while doing something else really takes that pressure away of there being too much focus on you. 
some people genuinely don't want to be doing their interactions in person and actually doing those things online is totally fine. That person can still access the community by themselves or with a member of staff and avoid interactions with others out there if that's how they feel comfortable. Because remembering, accessing the community is one good thing in itself and it isn't necessarily linked to being part of a community. So you know, being part of a community for that person can be the online community being accessed at home. Help them find a day service or club that operates over Zoom or Teams. If they don't like face-to-face -face video calling, look for online forums where you can type or share funny pictures. Perhaps online gaming is a way to go. It goes about saying it all needs to be planned just as well as if you were offline, because there will be all those safety aspects still to look into and checking that risks are managed. I know people do get annoyed by having to risk assess everything, but certainly as long as it's done in order to make things possible, it's worth doing the job properly and making sure a person has a positive experience. It doesn't put them off and they're not putting themselves in a really vulnerable position. That's where managed activities run by actual providers that provide clubs or forums that are run and moderated by a clear organisation are good. You know they're being monitored, you can support as well where necessary, but it's more practical and like you can take that step back and give more independence while still managing the risks. It's another learning experience as well for us because I remember when we first started getting online a lot because of COVID and I was attending an online day service that started. There were some people who actually behaved inappropriately to start with on the video calls. And it was in a way that they, they were members of the day service before it went online and they attended in person and they never behaved inappropriately in that way at their day service. And, you know, it was for a lack of understanding of this new thing, being inappropriately dressed or doing things, you know, perfectly acceptable in your bedroom in private. But of course, we were now all in our bedrooms, but also part of an online community from our bedroom. So we did all go through training agreements together and were all explained to like the quite confusing concept of how a private place could be a private place most of the time, but not always. So anyway, I think as well, and that's in the house, we don't always think of our house as a community in itself. But it is. You know, be sure to look around and check that people sharing the house together are not only encouraged to have interactions with staff. Are we being supported to make meaningful relationships with each other? Sometimes it can happen that everyone's trying to communicate with the staff member and we might wait politely and take turns but everybody's trying to get the moment to address the member of staff and not noticing each other really and actually the fact is the staff are probably going to be gone moved on to a new job at some point it's it's life it happens it's likely we're going to live with our housemates longer then we're going to be having each of you individually part of our lives. And it's actually really helpful to us if we're given the skills to support each other. And then when staff come and go, we have extra resilience to cope with that because we can lean on each other and still have those friendships rather than you all being gone. And then, you know, that's devastating if we don't have somebody left. Sometimes meeting the wider disabled community can be a wonderful thing. That's not in any way about feeling we have to only socialise with people with disability. We absolutely don't. But it can be great as one type of community to explore. We meet people that share struggles that we identify with, and there's great solidarity in that. I went on an activity holiday that was accessible for people with all different needs, and I made so many friends. People had been through some of the same things as me, they understood me. Also, I met my girlfriend there. We have such a lot in common personality-wise and talking to each other, but due to having different 
physical needs, we wouldn't we wouldn't have ended up living in the same house because yeah, sometimes it's just by necessity a care home has to be set up to specialise with something with challenging behaviour that comes from my wisdom. Or for instance, she would leave the house that has a hoist. And that doesn't always all go together in a care home. And, you know, so by being brave and going on that holiday, we found each other. And that, you know, wouldn't have happened if we didn't get out there. And um, yeah, thank you for listening to me. I would ask for questions, but we can't say so. <laughs> goodbye.